the NCAA is going to the Supreme Court. Yes, for the first time, the Supreme Court has decided that they will hear a case specifically dealing with the way athletes are treated in college sports. It's a massive story that has been on the headlines of almost every news organization over the last couple days. But I, and I think many of you, are wondering, what exactly is this case? And what exactly could it mean for the future of college sports? Well, I'm not smart enough to tell you, but thankfully, I know someone who is. A lawyer of three decades who has argued several cases in front of the Supreme Court. And also, he happens to be my dad. Today, we're joined by Van Aaron Hughes to talk about what exactly this Supreme Court case could mean for the future of college sports. All right, Dad, thank you so much for joining us here and lending us your perspective. Let's jump right in. I want to talk about this particular case that is headed to the highest court in the land. Can you just really quickly summarize what we're looking at here? Yeah, the case is NCAA versus Alston, and the Supreme Court just this week agreed to hear the case, which they do in only about 2% of the cases presented to them. So there's something right. about this case that interests them. It has to do with what limits the NCAA can put on benefits paid to student athletes. Um, and the specific issue has to do with education related benefits. So the Ninth Circuit disallowed a lot of the NCAA's caps on on benefits like um, post eligibility graduate scholarships and tutoring and health care and paid internships and free computers and other equipment. Mm -hmm. The NCAA has disallowed a lot of those limits. Oh, I'm sorry, the Ninth Circuit disallowed a lot of those limits. The Ninth Circuit did not say that you could just pay athletes cash beyond the cost of their of their education. Right. Um, but no doubt that's an issue that's going to come up in front of the Supreme Court now that the door is open to brief the case. Yeah. So that's kind of it, it's an interesting way to, to take this, because it's one thing to to say, here's all the here's all the to my eye kind of artificial limitations on all the things that you just said. But it's another issue entirely to say, here's a payout. And that's obviously been a huge issue. Um, why do you think the Supreme Court, what's the, what's the central kind of, what's the central argument here that's going to be made from both sides? And, and why do you think the Supreme Court decided to take this case over not only every other case that we've seen involving college sports, but also, like you said, 98% of the other cases that they would have seen involving anything? Well, I think the Supreme Court was interested because you just you don't see as many antitrust cases these days that that really frame an interesting issue. And this case does. This case addresses a murky area of the law, which is how do you reconcile the antitrust um, legislation and principles with amateur athletics, which as soon as you start looking at amateur athletics under an antitrust framework, you, you 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 get confused because how do you how do you square um, you, making sure there's competition in this case it would be competition between schools for the services of student athletes with the concept that that amateur athletics should be amateur which is different from professional you don't get paid those are those are competing considerations mm -hmm. the, the this area of the law is very murky and. The Alston decision rolls in all the all, a lot of the analysis from the previous major Ninth Circuit case had the O'Bannon case, right? Um, so those issues get tied in as well, and I think the Supreme Court saw an opportunity here to really clarify how this whole area of the law works in this context. And that O'Bannon case is something that a lot of the viewers of this channel will probably be very familiar with. In fact, it ties into the video that you're seeing right now because that the O'Bannon case is a big reason why we can't have college sports video games anymore, right? I mean, so that was, that was a central issue in that case as well. Yes, and that issue comes right back into, into play in Alston um, because that's a very similar analysis. How do you deal with, with athletes' names, images, and likenesses versus how do you deal with, with some of these other benefits that are at issue? And the athletes in the Alston case took a broad approach saying, look, you should just allow 
free competition. And if schools want to pay their athletes, let them pay them. And they actually didn't win on that position. Um, the NCAA won on that issue. The Ninth Circuit, the lower court and the Ninth Circuit both bought into the idea that this should be maintained, at college athletics should be maintained as amateur. And so they're kind of mm. nibbling around the edges. The NCAA's position to the Supreme Court is the Ninth Circuit allowed too much in that kind of puts the camel's nose under the tent of, of, of uh, professional style compensation. I, I wonder if there wasn't some discussion on the NCAA side um, whether they should even appeal this to the Supreme Court because they won on what seems to me the bigger issue. They won on the idea that, no, you can't just pay whatever you want to pay the student athletes. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a danger on their side that the Supreme Court might undermine that holding of the Ninth Circuit. Well, so can you kind of get into the NCAA's thought process a little bit? I mean, what what kind of what kind of remedy would they actually be looking for from the Supreme Court if, as you say, they won on the issue that they would be most concerned about? Well, you know, the parties haven't filed their briefs on the merits yet, so so this is speculation on my part. But I, I did read the petition they filed with the Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to hear the case, and the the focus in the petition was, uh, look we are a joint venture all of our universities are joint ventures so all of this antitrust analysis should be off the table let me back up and, and explain what what they mean there um you know when the nfl puts a salary cap and says you can't pay your players more than x million dollars mm -hmm. it's not an antitrust violation because the teams in the NFL are not really competing with each other. They're all part of one league, and really they're competing against other professional sports leagues for the, for huh. the viewers' dollars. Okay. And, and so that's not an antitrust issue, and you never, get in, you never have a court saying, well, we're going to decide whether the salary cap is set at the right amount. You know, They never get <laughs> right. into that because they right. say, well, that's a league. They're offering a competitive product, and they can all jointly right. decide how to do that. And that kind the of arbitration NCAA, happens within the league to to decide that salary cap. Yes, yes. The league decides and maybe it's part of the collective bargaining with the players, but it's not mm -hmm. a, a matter of litigation typically. And the NCAA wants that same kind of treatment. So the focus of their petition of the Supreme Court was, we're like the NFL. We're a joint venture. We're a bunch of universities who come together and we set these rules and we do it so that we can go out there and compete in the marketplace for you know sports entertainment mm -hmm. um, and the athletes would look at it very differently they'd say look the market here is the athletes and their services they're effectively employees right. of the universities and if you look at it that way the, the 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 ncaa has no no right under the antitrust law to say nope we're not going to pay you that's not fair so mm -hmm. it's two very different um, rubrics, two very different ways of looking at the issue. And so before the, there are a lot of arcane aspects of antitrust law that come into the Ninth Circuit decision, but before yeah. the Supreme Court even wades into that, it's gonna have to decide, how do we view this whole issue? Is, is the NCAA a joint venture offering one product or is this a labor market that we should be tr treating like other labor markets? Yeah, so we're kind of getting into something that I did really want to discuss for a lot of people that hear about antitrust, and, and myself included, if you've been following sports for any amount of time, and certainly if you remember back to, say, the USFL or, or something like that, we've heard a lot about antitrust in sports, but I think a lot of people uh, don't really have a concept of why antitrust law can get so messy the way the way that you just described it and so for you having been a litigator for three decades and and having dealt with a lot of antitrust issues can you can you explain why antitrust law is so is so just murky and and hard to work with well i can try <laughs> Antitrust law is designed to protect competition. The free marketplace doesn't work if you can't go out there and compete freely with other people in the market. Right. Um, so that's the whole concept is protecting competition, but it gets cloudy in this context, in the context of sports, because sports don't really work unless you put limits on how competition happens. Mm -hmm. Baseball doesn't work 
unless major major league baseball can come in and say this is how the playoffs are going to work and and this is how many players you're allowed to have on your team Mm -hmm. and if the new york yankees were to say nah to hell with that we're going to have 200 players and we're going to sign every good ball player on the planet and then (laughs) no one else can compete with this the whole system would fall apart no one would would be interested in watching baseball if if the yankees had all the good players right Uh, and and in in the case of baseball congress recognized that that's um different from the the usual usual antitrust context but in 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 the context of all sports leagues courts have realized that it's it's different you can't just act like uh the the denver broncos and the new england patriots are two competitors in the marketplace because that's not really what's happening they're part of a single league and they have to cooperate and they have to set limits and parameters and rules if, if football, if the National Football League is going to be successful and interesting right. to watch. So that gets really confusing when you get into, into college sports because now it's not a league of 32 teams. It's hundreds of universities and right. anyone who's a talented athlete who wants to go to school is now subject to all these different rules. Mm-hmm. And for a couple decades now, courts have been have been really at sea trying to reconcile protecting competition and making sure an individual athlete isn't uh, prevented from taking getting the benefit of his services while at the same time recognizing that the NCAA is is a you know a entrant in the sports entertainment market and and they have a unique product which is these amateur athletes and how do we how do we deal with that yeah and it seems to me that the a change might be coming because the the number of times that that we've said amateur right that that word continues to come up and that is a standard that's that's a definition that was set by the NCAA right i mean initially you the NCAA designed that standard really in order to protect themselves from liability and then as bigger business started to enter college sports and now we have the behemoth that we have now where it's making the money of a major professional league that standard continues to apply and so it seems to me that like we've seen in so many other industries this is the natural outgrowth of kind of an arcane standard that being the idea of amateurism that has now been taken into the place where the college football playoff makes billions of dollars the ncaa the ncaa tournament in men's basketball makes billions of dollars and so now is the time to to kind of reconcile that idea of amateurism it it is hard to wrap your head around the basic concept the ncaa signs a deal to receive a billion dollars a year for the rights to televise <laughs> March Madness, which is supposed to be an amateur competition. Right. So how do you get paid a billion dollars to show an amateur event? It's a little strange. <laughs> I, I'm the only comparable thing I, I can think of is the Olympics, but the Olympics are international and not subject to American antitrust laws the way the NCAA is. Right, right. And, and even in the case of the Olympics, the rules have been changed in almost every sport that I can think of over the last few years to allow professionals to play. So even then, well, it's a little different. Yeah, it's. I mean, there has been an evolution in terms of what we mean by amateur. And the Ninth Circuit in its decision seized on that and said, we don't, we're not even very clear on what this means. They quoted an SEC commissioner say, who was asked, what does it mean to be an amateur? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> So that's that. That's where you start with the the Ninth Circuit actually bought into the NCAA's concept that what differentiates our competitions from professional competitions is that our athletes are amateurs, and the Ninth Circuit said yes, that's true, and that should be maintained, and that's a pro-competitive thing, and yet huh. we don't really know what it means. <laughs> well, I mean, that it just it, it seems bizarre to me because the NCAA they're the ones that set. Like we said, they're the ones that set that that term, that definition. So for the NCAA to say, no, we're, we're different from, from professional sports because our players are amateurs. I mean, they might have said, we're different from professional sports because our players are hay pennies. Like they, they could have used any word there 
and and it would it would have meant the same thing. That seems like a weird thing for the court to say. Oh, you're right. You you are different from professional sport because of this word that you defined. Well, but I think they have to try to to hold their ground on that distinction because if you mm -hmm. if you if you say which the athletes are going to argue to the Supreme Court that calling the athletes amateurs doesn't really mean anything anymore, then at that point, if you treat them the same as you would treat a professional athlete in a professional sport, how can you have any limits? How can you say they're not going to get paid above this amount? They're not going to get benefits beyond this. Why shouldn't they? The, the right. only legitimate defense the NCAA has is we can't do that because then they wouldn't be amateurs anymore. In fact, they had some other arguments in the district court that they didn't even bother arguing to the Ninth Circuit. They said, you know what? That's our that's our one leg to stand on is our yeah. athletes are amateurs and we want to make sure they're amateurs. Interesting. I think that a question that kind of comes up in my mind, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this, the obvious difference between the NCAA and, and professional leagues is that professional leagues like every every player let's let's for example take the nfl every player in the nfl played in the ncaa but not every player in the ncaa is going to play in the nfl so if the ncaa tries to make an argument based around the nfl is not our competition meaning that we shouldn't be held to the standard of the nfl where we pay our players we have these certain benefits we do all these different things we shouldn't be held to that standard because we are not on the same level as the nfl we don't even play on the same days is that an argument that would hold water and and how would the athletes deal with an argument like that well it's interesting because the ncaa's position is we don't want to be treated by the like the nfl and one of the reasons why is it, it benefits competition for the NFL to be able to do their professional thing and for us to be able to do our amateur thing. And consumers are better off because now they can watch pros on Sunday or they can watch student athletes on Saturday or both. They have more choices. And isn't that what the antitrust laws are all about is, is giving consumers choices. Right. Um, and the Ninth Circuit pretty much agreed with that way of looking at it. That way mm -hmm. of looking at it, I think the athletes are going to say, whoa, whoa, back up a minute. The market we're talking about here is our services as athletes, and and we, it's only fair to treat us like the players on Sunday because we're doing the same thing and we're getting our skulls bashed in, and, and right. this is the benefit to us. And a lot of us aren't going to have multi-million dollar professional contracts in a few years, so we should be allowed to receive the benefits we can get right now. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the tension that, that the Supreme Court is going to be grappling with. Yeah, and I think that when you extend it beyond football, it, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the league system and and the idea that, you know, players get drafted out of college to play in the NFL or play in the NBA, these different places. But I think when you extend it, when you look at sports like, say, track and field or sports like that, where when you turn professional, it's actually because – you know, you've been signed on with a sponsor and you get these endorsement deals and, and things like that. And they pay for you to train ideally so that you can go compete in the Olympics or you can compete in the Diamond League or these other you know professional track and field competitions. And so to me, that argument for the NCAA to say we're a completely different thing, it doesn't. It doesn't really hold water when you extend it to these different sports where the only reason why an NCAA track and field star who's on pace to go to the Olympics, the only reason that they can't sign with a sponsor is because the NCAA told them not to. There's no other barrier to that. And so from that perspective, they, exactly to your point, can look at it and say, I do literally the same thing as what these professionals do, but because I do it for a school, for a college in the United States, instead of for Nike or for Reebok or one of these places, I don't get paid, but that other person who's two years older than me doing the same thing does get paid. How do you reconcile that? Right. I think there was a time where the distinction between a, an amateur and a professional was fairly simple. Are you getting paid or not? And that was, mm -hmm. that was a yes or no question. And now it's absolutely not a yes or no question. And, and, right. and the court's got to figure out, does it really make sense to say, the NCAA had this approach that they advocated in the Ninth Circuit, the not one penny approach. They said, 
you can get paid, you can receive these benefits up to the cost of attending the university. And beyond that, you can't get one penny, not one penny, because then you're a professional. And the yeah. courts look at the record in front of it saying, okay, the University of Kentucky builds a $100 million fabulous palatial <laughs> facility for its athletes to live in. Is that not one penny? How does this make any sense? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think that from from an athlete's perspective, you know, they're saying, look, we're we're asked to do a lot more than your typical student would be when they show up on campus. And and to their credit, I mean, athletes are asked to do a lot, you know, when it comes to the practice, when it comes to getting up early in the morning, you got to maintain the grades. And so the, the schedule that they're that they're asked to have is is really insane in, in a lot of ways. So from their perspective, I'm guessing the argument is going to be, you know, why are we getting treated like any other student up to the cost of admittance when the job we're being asked to do is wholly unique when compared to any other student? It, it really is. And I think that's part of why the Supreme Court wanted to weigh in on this, because the Ninth Circuit, with all respect, um, through the Obama decision into the Olson decision, it's hard to read those decisions and not feel like they're they're flailing a little bit. You know, Alston says you can't limit education related benefits. So if a school wants to give one of their athletes a scholarship to attend graduate school after they're done playing, you can't stop them from doing that. Well, do any of us believe that all of the athletes playing division one sports, particularly uh, football and basketball, mm -hmm. that their main concern is whether their graduate school is going to get paid for it. You know, that's, <laughs> that's not, that that's not the, the, the limit of, of what they'd like to be able to receive from their services. And, and so some clarification is I think warranted from the Supreme court. Yeah. And, and like you said at the very beginning, that's probably a big reason why the Supreme court decided to take on this case i mean what what do you think what kind of precedent would you expect to be set here by the supreme court what did they see in this well here's what i don't expect i don't expect the supreme court in this case to say you know what these athletes are employees and it's an antitrust violation to limit what they can be paid mm -hmm. schools can just go out and compete and pay athletes whatever they want yeah. Because not not because I don't think the Supreme Court believes that they may very well may and that may be where we end up 20 years from now, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's what the issue that this case frames. This case frames more narrow issues, and I think the Supreme Court, the issue will be you know on the narrow issues who wins? Did the NCAA get to limit you know uh, education related benefits the way they've tried to do? But the broader issue will be. How does the Supreme Court look at this market? And if they are talking about student athletes as employees and what kind of limits on employee compensation do, do the antitrust laws permit, then the NCAA is going to be swallowing hard thinking, OK, we're in trouble, not in this case, but in the next case, 5, 10, 15 yeah. years from now. Yeah. Um, if, on the other hand, the NCAA is saying, well, the is, I'm sorry, if, on the other hand, the Supreme Court is treating the NCAA like any other sports league and saying, well, these limits are sort of like um, salary caps in the NFL, then the NCAA is going to feel pretty good and mm -hmm. feel like, OK, we can keep doing what we're doing for another generation or two. So this could particularly or th this could potentially uh, be kind of a stopgap in what is going to become a much bigger issue that the Supreme Court one day would will, will deal with. This could potentially be, as we hear so many times, the Supreme Court takes a, a particular look at, the, at, at a very specific issue and kind of kick the can down the road and leave it open to say, you know, the court in, like you said, 5, 10, 15 years, that court will look at the precedent that we've set and make a much, a much broader decision. Yes. And I think one way or another, that is inevitable. And my guess is that that's the reason the NCAA has appealed this decision. Because if you looked in the short term, mm -hmm. I think the NCAA would say, well, the outcome of this Alston decision in the Ninth Circuit is actually pretty decent. You know, we don't like some of the details 
of what the Ninth Circuit said, but they, the big picture is they agreed that we're allowed to keep our athletes amateurs and they're not saying that you can be paid cash beyond the expense of your education. So all that is good. Mm -hmm. But I think they looked in the long term and they said in the long term, what the Ninth Circuit has said is, is you know, a, a hole in the dam that's going to turn into a flood pretty soon because we can't draw a distinction between graduate scholarships and Ferraris. And, and we don't have any way of stopping the bleeding once you go down this path. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the Supreme Court and we're better off in the long term if we can make the argument none we, none of this kind of compensation should be allowed if we say it's not allowed because we're allowed to govern our own members of our joint venture hmm. i think that's what they're going for but they've opened the door for the athletes to go the other direction and, and argue to the supreme court hey stop treating us as as um people who don't have a right in our own futures and how we're treated and you know we're doing hard work and we're entitled to bargain for compensation just like any other employee. And I, I, I think part of what's going to come up in front of the Supreme Court in, in 2020, it's, it's hard to pretend you don't see this. A huge percentage of these athletes are minorities, particularly African-Americans. And how, how do we feel about that? That, a hu that these people are being told you can't bargain for fair payment for your services at some point does that play in where the Supreme Court has to say, wait a minute, you're you're treating this group of people differently than we treat a lot of other group of pe groups of people who, who sell their services. And why are we limiting what this particular group can receive for their services? <clears throat> Interesting. I, I, I never really even took that angle with it, but that you're saying that's a potential argument that that could be made by the athletes. Yeah, I don't know that it's uh, going to be a viable legal argument, but I, I guarantee you that that will be mentioned in their brief, that that will be part of how they try to characterize this to the Supreme Court, that, look, we're being treated unfairly. We're not being given, given a chance to receive fair compensation for our services. And it's got to bother you that you know, a huge percentage of the people whose services are at issue are, you know, are black and and why is that okay and hmm. i don't think the supreme court is going to issue a decision based on that based on equal protection or based on race discrimination but mm -hmm. if the athletes can can plant that seed i think that plays into how the supreme court perceives the whole issue oh i i see i see interesting so it's 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 like uh one one cog in a much broader argument that the supreme court will ultimately take up Exactly. And, you know, maybe it doesn't gain any traction at all, but I'd be surprised if, if the players didn't at least advance that that idea. Interesting. Uh, well, as, as we begin to wrap up here, I would be remiss if I didn't mention your other career, which is, of course, writing science fiction. And you've been published in almost every major science fiction magazine there is. You've been doing it for, for several years now. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to think that you've gotten quite good at it. So I'm going to ask you to put on your science fiction writer's hat here and look into the future. Take me about, you know, 50 years I I into the future, uh, long beyond when anyone, long beyond the time that, that anyone is actually watching this video will be playing in college sports. What, what will the future of college sports actually look like a long time down the road, in your opinion? Uh, good question. Um, what I fear and what I think is the most likely outcome is that there is no meaningful way to draw the line on how athletes are compensated. And so therefore, sooner or later, we hit the point where schools, a top notch athlete coming out of high school is the subject of a bidding war between schools and Alabama says we'll pay you 500,000 and and USC says we'll pay you 600,000 and and if if it plays out that way I think what you what you'll end up saying is that the college sports turn into a minor league that it's mm -hmm. they're professionals just like in the NFL or the NBA they're just professionals who are getting paid a little bit less than than the nfl and nba athletes uh -huh. and while they develop their skills um i don't really want to see that you know I, I love college sports and i feel like they are different from professional sports and yet 
boy, you know, it bothers me. Like if I had a child who went to, to play Division One basketball and wasn't good enough for the NBA, and I knew that their hard work was bringing in millions and millions of dollars for their school, and and they hardly see a dime of that. All they get out of it is is free meals and tutoring. That would bother me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that uh, even as a science fiction writer, I can't think of what the scenario is going to be that avoids that us ending up there. Um, can you? Well, I would think that I would think the scenario that would avoid that is if the conferences, the may, really the Power Five, the SEC, the ACC, uh -huh. the Big Twelve, the Big Ten, and the Pac Twelve, if they got together and they said, we are going to break away from the NCAA and we're going to nip this thing in the bud. So first of all, we're going to ditch the idea of, of amateurism. We're just going to get rid of that word. And instead, we are going to we are going to actually sell a different product than the profession than than professional leagues, because like you said, college sports are different. And I absolutely agree. I mean, when you look at the passion that goes into college sports, to me, it, it doesn't compare to to professionals. I mean, people love their professional teams, but when it comes to college sports, that is that is passion unlike anything that, that we see in this country. And so I think the Power Five can break away and they say, all right, forget this idea of amateurism, but we're selling a different product. So what we're we're not we're not going to pay you. Like we're not going to give you a salary or anything like that. But we are going to allow you to make money off of your name, image, and likeness, and we're not going to regulate that at all. And so whatever money you can make based off of that, you've earned, and that will make up for the fact that we're not going to pay you a salary. But those players that, you know, th those athletes that aren't going to make much, if, if any, money off of their name, image, or likeness, they still get their scholarship, they still get an education, and so it's still... It still allows people who would not otherwise have had the means or the desire to go to college now get a free education at, at a major university. And I mean, we can do an entirely separate video about the quality of that education, you know, given the schedule that athletes have to keep. But it is an education nonetheless, and it, and it does open some doors to me. That seems like the best way to avoid what you say, just this bidding war where we end up you know, the players are basically playing professionally out of high school. They're just doing it for a different league and for a little bit less money. That all makes sense. I'm going to add one other wrinkle, which is, yeah, you know, there's nothing in the constitution about, about college football. <laughs> this, is, this all arises out of statute. The Sherman Act is a statute that was passed by Congress. Mm -hmm. Congress can change it. So the Supreme Court doesn't get the last word on this issue. The Supreme Court could say, you know what, under the antitrust laws, everything the NCAA is does is invalid. And you sport, play sport, pay your athletes whatever you want. And at that yeah. point, then the attention turns to Congress because Congress would have to think about, should we pass a law to limit this? And and mm -hmm. there are already there's already proposed legislation out there. I think Senator Rubio has, has a bill out there. There are already attempts to grapple with this in Congress. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to maintain college sports as different from professional and yet make sure the athletes are fairly compensated? Um, and maybe, you know, as, as little faith as I have in our legislators, I know a lot of them are <laughs> sports fans. So maybe they'll come up with something good. <laughs> that's, that's, a great, that's a great point. That is a great point. So at the end of the day, what we're seeing here from the Supreme Court is just one piece in an equation that ultimately involves the court, it involves Congress, it involves all of these different organizations. And so this is going to be a developing situation of which this particular case is one piece, albeit a pretty large piece, a pretty big step when it comes to litigating this whole matter. Yes, that's right. Okay, interesting. Well, uh, we'll continue to keep an eye on it, of course, and I hope that uh, if and when, I mean, I mean, you know, we know how long the Supreme Court takes to, to do anything, but when they, when we get any kind of, you know, news or any kind of decision from the Supreme Court, I hope that, uh, that we can bring you back and we can talk about the potential ramifications of, of whatever happens. And, and thank you very, very much for talking to us today. Uh, this has been absolutely enlightening, and I think 
in my opinion, I might be a little biased, but in my opinion, it's worth every minute that you spend watching this video. So thank you so much for, for joining us and helping us explain this complicated issue. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And for you out there, remember to subscribe. We try to do stuff like this a lot. And so we always we always try to keep people informed and, and talk about some interesting stuff. And I think that there was some very interesting things discussed today. So subscribe. Let us know in the comments. You know how much we love discussion. We appreciate you.